How do you commit genocide? There's the old-fashioned way, outright slaughter. And when it comes to Native Americans, nobody beats the expanding countries of the United States and Canada. Credible estimates of the indigenous population in North America in 1492 are between 12.5 and 18.5 and million. Through the combination of massive epidemics and the Indian wars waged by the U.S. Army through the decades after the Civil War, by 1890, the estimated Native American population had been reduced to fewer than 240,000 in the U.S. and in Canada, a third of that, a population reduction of 95 to 99 percent. But what about the remaining 1 to 5 percent? You can't just allow them to rebuild their decimated communities and reverse all your hard work, can you? Enter Colonel Richard Pratt, intrepid Indian fighter and former head of the Fort Marion Military Prison for Apache prisoners, who in 1892 declared, A great general, Philip Sheridan, has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. In a sense, I agree with that sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. In other words, assimilate the survivors, educate them to become suitable to be members of the society that had devastated and despised them. So in the 1860s, religious orders began setting up schools on reservations aiming to convert the children to Christianity. But the U.S. Indian Commission concluded that assimilation could not be successful as long as the children still lived at home and return to their families at the end of each day? The answer? Remove the children. So from the 1870s to the mid-20th century, U.S. policy decreed that every Native American child would be taken from his or her home, family, community, and culture, beginning as early as five years of age, and sent to off-reservation boarding schools where they were to remain for up to a decade in state-sponsored educational facilities. As many as 500 Indian boarding schools in the U.S., 153 Indian boarding schools, and many more religious schools run by Christian denominations and paid for by the government. At its peak, this complex of boarding schools could hold nearly half of all Native American children at one time. A total of about 150,000 children ultimately attended these schools. When the principal used to beat up, beat up the other children, like boys, the boys got the most uh, beating. They used to call it bench party, and it was usually done after supper. And that's where I got frightened, because I saw blood. These places were run like military schools, marching to meals, and the virtues of patriotism and obedience were instilled. Education was designed to serve an extreme assimilationist agenda, aiming to inculcate subservience to Western values, like private property and, and me first. Some were self-described industrial schools that focused on training, not education. The young women learned to become maids and household servants or to work in commercial laundries. The young men were taught the skills needed to work for ranchers and farmers or for factory, mine, and mill operators throughout the western United States. A devastating discovery has been made in Canada. The remains of 215 children have been found buried at the site of a former boarding school for indigenous students. Children were systematically found to be underfed and underweight. Together with forced labor, this caused staggering disease-driven mortality rates. Epidemics of deadly infectious diseases were common, including tuberculosis and at times smallpox. At the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania, of the 73 Shoshone and Arapaho children enrolled between 1881 and 1894, only 26 survived. A 1908 study by the Smithsonian Institution found that overall only one in every five students was likely to be, quote, entirely free, end quote, of symptoms of tuberculosis. And I can remember the principal, uh 
grabbing a hold of me by the hand, you know, and, uh, and I was jumping off the floor like that, and he stripped me. And he started whacking me with a, a long, webbed uh, a strap. He was setting an example that, you know, if you do this, this is what's going to happen to you. Like, and all the other boys are watching. And, and you, you learn pretty quick after getting those kind of beatings. Not strapping, it's, it's literally beatings, you know. And uh, ever since that day, I tried to run away. Physical, emotional, and sexual abuse of the children by those who ran these schools was widespread. Many of the youngsters died trying to escape the schools and return to their reservations. Those who were captured and brought back to the schools were brutally beaten. In fact, brutal physical abuse, torture, was brought down on boys and girls alike for any number of violations. So that was the start of my indoctrination, where they say, kill the Indian in a child. That's exactly what they were doing, killing. When you left the residential school, it was very, very isolated incidents where people would go back and live on reserve. We were gone. In 1910, the U.S. Indian Commissioner described their policy as, quote, a mighty pulverizing engine for breaking up the last vestiges of the tribal mass, end quote. Slaughter, disease, and forced assimilation. That is how you commit genocide.